make a big noise playing in the street gonna be a big man someday I want to start with this and I want you to think about it I wish we were in class together to kind of throw these ideas around but to you thinking about what this particular module is about what do you think medievalism is now I said already I gave you a hint it's not the real Middle Ages it's not looking at real middle medieval culture it's something else so what is it and why is it such an important thing for us to talk about and why is it that people choose it time and time again when I give people the choice students the choice to have a, a module that they want on anything any type of movie genre and every time they choose medievalism why is it that we are fascinated with this medieval past what are some movies that you have seen or some shows that have this medievalism that have a medieval aspect to it um, and are there things coming out so that is kind of some things for you to think about as we as we explore this as we look at this at, from now until the end of the term um, and I want you to explore and as you drive around the town that you live in as you look in the community um, if, as you switch on the TV or go to the movies what part of this medieval culture do you see thrown into your face time and time again as you put on commercials as you go get food as you have chats with people as you look at the news as you look at politics um, it's everywhere and so it's really interesting for you to kind of if you're aware of that if you can see it if you can understand it you'll have a bit of a chuckle and you'll see what's happening uh, as a way to construct uh, a social reality through something that's made up but we have created it to think it's real and that is medievalism not the real medieval past but something else so that's what we're going to explore here in this little lecture so medievalism is used in movies all the time and one particular movie you might remember is Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction have you seen that do you remember this particular scene if you have where one gets medieval on someone's hindquarters combined with a racial homophobic slur using the n-word um, and have a good old boy same-sex raping uh, it's a brutal scene it's a brutal movie but it brings up the definition and it brings up the concept of medievalism and the view of Quentin Tarantino's mind uh, as weird as that mind may be he, he creates an idea of let's get medieval on yo ass what this direct quote is and it makes an image in the mind more graphic more gruesome than anything he can actually put on the screen uh, just by making you create the image in your head as a viewer so he says I'm gonna get medieval on you and you think what why did he choose that why does he say I'm gonna get medieval he can't even show as bad as the image that you create in your own mind to get medieval is to step outside the symbolic order of our own world and into a new imaginary world that collapses directly into an unspeakable and unimaginable real world for better or for worse so we have a medieval view of love right and the chivalry chivalry code you ever hear that idea that chivalry is dead um, that's because it's creating this ideal of what a man should be relating with a woman in, in a medieval context. Or Quentin Tarantino, current Tarantino uh, getting medieval on yo ass is the other direction. It's an imaginary world uh, even more grotesque than we can imagine today. Um, the real Middle Ages wasn't really that dark, but it's been created and it's been seen as the Dark Ages for so long that it's hard to break past that there has been a heritage created that it's so dark and so um, un you can't obtain it it's got a lot of features that are both scary and um, and dark but at the same time virtues that have been lost through the ages um, so creating the most sort of perfect um, society that is lost kind of like the noble savages the way they think of a lost society of Native Americans um, similar thing with an ancient medieval past 
Um, that's not exactly the way it is, but that's the way society tends to view things. Now, when I was in preparing, when I was preparing for this lecture today and for and just information for your this class, um, I went down to the archives, did some work there, looking at some real medieval documents and looking around. And then I went for a walk in the cathedral and looking at this wonderful vaulted ceiling um, and this wonderful building that's made out of, chiseled out of stone, um, that were made in the late 1200s and early mid 1300s. Um, you have different knights that are buried in the tombs uh, with their wonderful images and with, next to their wives and with their armor. So you can see who they were, their status is clear on their, on their tomb of who they were. Um, and as you walk around here, it's, it's really a cemetery but it's also a, a, a capsule, a time capsule of the Middle Ages, uh, right in the middle of the city. And then you go outside the cathedral and you look at it and you look at it in the midst of this modern city with the stores and the people walking around. Um, and that is a really interesting symbolism of what's going on here, where there's here in the Exeter, there's medieval presence everywhere. Um, even across the street from where I live is a what's called a chantry chapel. Uh, so it's a place for where uh, different monks would be paid to to pray. Um, because on the street corner there, um, it's a medieval street. But in the old, in the medieval time, uh, this part of my town that I live in is called Heavy Tree. And the reason it's called Heavy Tree is because of what they would be hanging from the trees people and they would hang people here they um, and that on that specific corner they would hang people there was witches burned at the stake there there was heretics burned um, and because of all the people killed there uh, they created a church to pray for the the souls of those that died on that corner um, so I am surrounded I'm absolutely surrounded by a medieval presence everywhere the interesting thing is that makes sense here there's a medieval presence from that time period but it is something that is so huge and so uh, longing for in Eng American culture you see it all over in American culture um, might not have a direct link to a medieval past but it's still there go into the mall in Reading and you'll get to uh, I'm, I'm guessing it's still there you'll have a round table pizza right that's connecting and making it sort of a connection to King Arthur maybe, um, or White Castle, or if maybe you played Dungeon and Dragons, or maybe you go to LA and other places around the United States and go to medieval times where you have a beer wench and you, have, you get to watch jousting, um, and different Facebook games that are always popping up that are medieval, um, and of course film and movies coming out. And don't forget, if you're Northern California, that one of the best things is go outside of Chico to uh, Vina, which is a Cistercian monastery there uh, called New Clairvaux. And not only do they make wine, it's up to you of how good it is. I think it's pretty horrible, but um, it's okay. Some of the oldest vines actually in California, owned by Leland Stanford. And if you remember, he's the one that paid perhaps one of the early... Uh, film patrons, if you will, because he had that bet about the horse, uh, and then they were able to videotape, if you will, early videotape, uh, early film um, that the horse's legs are all off the ground. Well, that was Leland Stanford, who started Stanford University, but he also had vines outside of Chico. Later, now it's part of Vina, and it's part of Cistercian Monastery. They teamed up with Sierra Nevada Brewing Company um, to and went back to Belgium, and got real monk recipes, medieval recipes for beer. And now you can go to Sierra Nevada, buy Ovila Watt beer, and taste and consume medievalism. You can consume medieval beer in Vina in Northern California. And that's how they market it, that they have, that the money went to building the authentic medieval chapter house. Um, there's a long story about that, but William Randolph Hearst, the big uh, newspaper tycoon, he was building his next palace basically up uh, outside of McLeod area, um, right before devastation of the um, financial crisis of the stock market crash, which he wasn't completely ruined, but it was enough that he couldn't build his place anymore. And he was going to have a bedroom. And this bedroom was an original medieval chapter house, or medieval um, 
part of a huge abbey that they dismantled in Spain and brought over. Um, and those stones laid to waste in um, Golden Gate Park for a long time. If you go to the Japanese um, tea garden there, the, the path, the stone path is made out of a lot of the stones. And then eventually they donated them to the monastery, trying to give it back to an original medieval past. Um, Cistercians there have been rebuilding this chapter house and you can go visit it. And it's an original medieval building that's now in Northern California. I don't think that's a, there's a better example of medievalism going on here where they created a medieval past right in the hills of Northern California, right in the middle of uh, outside of Chico. And they've teamed up with Sierra Nevada where you can consume. And that's the thing about people wanting to consume medievalism, be a part of it, drink the ale. Or what about this? One of my favorite things that I saw today uh, in the cathedral, they're raising money for the cathedral and they're building a model of a, a replica of the cathedral with Legos. And people have been coming all over to see this building of this Lego replica of the, of the cathedral. Um, and of course, little kids love it, uh, big kids love it. Um, and you could you know, spend money and of course buy your brick and uh, you can have a little certificate or whatever. Um, and so you're consuming medievalism in that way as well, through Legos, through kids' to toys. Um, so it's all around us. Uh, it's all around me here, but I know it's living in California all my life. I know it's all around us there as well um, and throughout the United States, throughout the world. Um, so I'm interested as we go through this and as you start thinking of it in this way, um, how this idea of medievalism, the ideals themselves, uh, the identity has been shaped largely by this um, sort of structure of medieval past, this medievalism um, that has engulfed everything around us. So when it comes to medieval film uh, and the portrayal of medievalism in film, uh, that goes back from the beginning too. Some of the earliest films have to do with ideas and uh, uh, the longing for and sort of recreation of the knights and knights code. Um, the, of course, the chivalric codes um, that um, is part of film early on. Uh, even some films such as uh, Gone with the Wind has arguably been a medieval film um, with the ideals and the genre um, rather than a castle, the plantation, uh, rather than a knight, the Civil War soldier. Um, so you could recreate a lot of the stories and the ideas of the medieval past and into a whole different package. Um, but some of the original, if you go back to the late medieval, medieval period, it was starting to happen even back then, even in the 12th century, with a guy named Chrétien de Troyes, right? So Chrétien of Troy, uh, connecting himself to a older past of uh, the idea of Troy, the idea of the ancient Greek world. Um, but Chrétien de Troyes, most famous for his recreation of the stories of King Arthur, taking these oral stories um, that come out of the area I'm actually living in, in Southwest England, um, not far from here is the medieval um, story where King Arthur's castle was. It's not true, but it, in the Middle Ages they believed it to be true. Um, and Chrétien de Troyes took these stories of King Arthur, these stories of Lancelot, stories of Guinevere, and um, how a woman should be, how a knight should be, how a king should be, a nobleman should be, and packaged that all in a very popular story in the Middle Ages that we still have today. So much so that they're recreating the movie yet again in just a couple weeks coming out. But the, of, of King Arthur. But that story goes back even before 12th century troubadours, uh, storytellers and um, bards, people who were telling stories through song, traveling around. Um, and Chrétien de Troyes writing that down um, and creating what's known as the chivalric codes through that, how someone should act. Um, so he's doing that through King Arthur. King Arthur's doing that again for our society Yet again, showing us how we should act or how society is or who the enemy is. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how Guy Ritchie, the filmmaker of the newest King Arthur, is repackaging medievalism into the audience for the audience today and what are the hidden messages in there. 
It's not a bad thing, it's the way it works. But what are the messages? Who are it connecting to as far as uh, the enemies of Western culture, for example? Who are the, how is it to be a, a soldier? How is it to be a man? How is it to be a woman? Those are all things that are gonna be repackaged in this film uh, coming out. It always is and it always will be. But also you can't uh, deny how much medievalism plays a role to the foundation of the most loved series that has come back with a force in the last few years, that is Star Wars. Star Wars is at the very heart a medieval story. Yes, it takes place in a galaxy long, far, far away, long, long ago, um, but it is a medieval story. So maybe you haven't heard of the Star Wars series. Um, my guess is you probably heard of it. Maybe you haven't seen it though. Um, but in essence, the original film, the original Star Wars uh, movies that came out uh, is about a coming of age story about an orphaned boy named Luke Skywalker uh, whose endeavors to become to become what many of people have heard of it before a, a, a knight a Jedi knight right uh, a Jedi knight like his father before him uh, keeping the social order of those who fight uh, in the Middle Ages you had three orders those who pray those who fight and those who work well Star Wars carries on that same sort of medieval idea because those who fight, those knights, well, those Jedi Knights, those come from the same order. If you're a Jedi Knight, there's some sort of blood connection in that line. That is a very medieval concept. Luke Skywalker is just like King Arthur, who discovers his identity only by pulling a sword from a stone. Um, and Luke himself, maybe he didn't pull the sword from a stone, but he found out about his past. Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi presents him with his father's lightsaber, just like Excalibur presented to King Arthur. Um, the process of him learning is more uh, fighting, but as a whole, he was learning the code of a Jedi. That's the same sort of thing. That's a very medieval concept of the code of a knight, the chivalric code. Uh, it's just Jedi code, it's different, same thing, repackaged. But of course, just as much as it reveals about medieval ideals, it also reveals about, well, the original films, 19th century, 1970s culture, uh, American culture. Um, when his first Star Wars came out, certainly the newest Star Wars uh, that came out in the last year and that's coming out again this Christmas, uh, shows culture of our own identity today. Um, in 1970, you have one of the most iconic images is Princess Leia um, as the slave to, um, to Jabba the Hutt. Um, and she doesn't talk as she's um, uh, sort of as a slave to Jabba um, in her little bikini, 1970s bikini thing. How is women portrayed differently in the newer Star Wars, right? So you see a different way of, of the feminine a uh, powerful woman. In fact, there's a powerful woman knight coming about, right? There's a, a Jedi, uh, fighters. That's what you wouldn't see in the 1970s, but you're seeing it in the films today. It's a new age, new, new identity uh, that has the audience connects to, film has to um, come alongside of it, but it's still repackaged medievalism in a different way. So lastly, medievalism, there's, we could talk about this all day. There's all kinds of films, all kinds. We could talk about Braveheart and how it connects to Scottish nationalism. In fact, if you go to uh, one of the battles that the, William William, the original William Wallace fought in, and um, uh, more so uh, Robert the Bruce, but um, if you've seen the movie Braveheart, uh, Mel Gibson, um, there's a statue that came out 10 years, about 10 years after the movie, in Scotland at the, the scene of one of the major battles called uh, um, Battle Stirling. And the statue is hilarious because it gives more homage to Mel Gibson than it does to the actual historical figure. Shows you how much the film does affect the audience. And that's you know a big thing of our class is how much film changes the identity and mindset of our past and who we are. And um, this is an example, if you look at this statue, of how much the movie Braveheart affected the national heritage and even the memory of the historical past through this statue. The statue is now taken away, I was last told. 
um, but it's interesting to see. But our last film worth that we need to talk about, the last sort of part of medievalism, is the film we're going to watch. And that is A Knight's Tale that came out in 2001 um, with the late Heath Ledger, uh, main actor in it, um, which stim simulates an, a 14th century story about jousting. It's a sports movie, really, more than anything. Um, so about jousting. Um, but the audience, you're the audience, but you're also put into the seats of the jousting tournament, looking on to this medieval feast of sport. Um, and so you're right in the middle of all that. In many ways, it makes fun of chivalric culture. It makes fun of medieval culture. Um, it's, it makes fun of our current sports culture, perhaps, um, where it sort of gives homage to it. Um, originally, it has its it's very anachronistic, okay? I think if any film, if anything you would say about it, you would say it's anachronistic. In fact, um, there's a Facebook page um, that you can go to. Um, I'll, I'll post it if you're interested or you can email me. Um, but if you look at this, I posted some information about uh, what I was doing with our class. And a bunch of people, I wanted pe uh, medievalists, actual people who do medieval history, write books about it, what they thought of me assigning this movie to my class um, and you can check it out there's some very interesting comments um, people seem to agree and understand uh, as far as medievalism not real medieval history um, it fits perfectly because that's what it is it's a medieval heritage um, and it's an idea of it rather than a true historical past um, it's even my favorite is the the women's outfits um, especially the court outfits of going to the jousting, how much their outfits change. And they have nothing to do with medieval. Lots of times they look more uh, Asian influence than medieval European influence. So it's interesting to see. Um, the original story though, the, A Knight's Tale, was one of the many tales in the, uh, the, the stories by Chaucer. Chaucer is a character in this movie, one of my favorite characters in this movie, um, but he is, and he, he kind of makes fun of uh, get the, the, the fact that he is a writer, um, but the original story was written by him. Um, it's a great story, I recommend reading it. In fact, I might post it for you to read um, to tie it into the true story so you can see what's kind of the base of it. Um, also, uh, uh, Ultric, Ultric van Lichtenstein, the knight that is, uh, Heath Ledger plays, is a real knight. Uh, in real life, he was a, a true story, a true person. Um, and this picture is, uh, is him, um, the real picture of the real Ultric van Lichtenstein. Um, but it, it talks about, this movie talks about how important it is to have that lineage. If you don't have that lineage, you can't be a knight, no matter how good you are. That's what's wrong with that culture. But then the end of the movie brings in more of 20th, 21st century uh, ideals than it does real medieval ones. But it's just repackaged and to hit a different audience. Um, and this is, uh, it'll be interesting to get your idea. Um, it's the perfect example of what's called cinematic pastiche. Pastiche is a great word to really show the artistic work, this case a film, that imitates that of another work or period. So it imitates medievalism, but it's medieval pastiche. It's imitating medievalism, not being real medieval, right? So it imitates the medieval culture. That's pastiche. It's imitating it. It's not trying to be the original thing. And that's what this movie is, you see. Um, but it's based on a true story, Ultric van Lichtenstein. It's based on Chaucer's story, um, A Knight's Tale by the same name. Um, and, and the way both the story of Chaucer's Knight um, and the 2001 movie are a celebration of spectacle. It's a celebration of the celebrity night, the spectacle, the hero worship that we do of sports stars today. Not much different. You can connect it. Same was happening back in the 1300s um, in the 13th century. A modern sporting events um, is not much different than back then. In fact, one of the most famous knights in the Middle Ages, his name was William Marshall, um, he became so famous and he won so many matches, he, he became one of the, the knights uh, to teach kings. He taught three or four kings and he was an advisor to a king just because of his status as a celebrity going around jousting tournaments. 
not much different than celebrities today or people who are actors becoming politicians. Same thing was happening in the Middle Ages with knights and with sport and with the fighting um, that was going on. So let's wrap up this module and really wrap up this whole class um, by looking at medievalism and looking at a knight's tale. Um, because both there is the, the truth, uh, the, the original historical story um, with Chaucer and Ulrich van Lichtenstein, uh, both real medieval stories, um, but then this is a film class. This is about film and why film is chosen and what that says about our society and about humanity, right? Um, humanity is being how we record the human story. Um, why is so much of that human story wrapped in this idea of medievalism? Um, why is that such a, a important genre in a culture that really doesn't have an authentic medieval past? But then you can question and ask, well, what is authenticism? Uh, what really is authentic? Um, if they're making it up even in the Middle Ages, then there's pastiche happening from the Middle Ages till today. Um, so when people argue what is authentic, if a movie is portrayed authentically, um, or if a story is authentic, um, that's, uh, that's an argument that you can be a part of and sort of say, well, really, what is authentic? What is historical truth? What's important? Um, if, a hist if a heritage and identity is connected to something, is that really as important or is that really not as important as saying, well, that doesn't have any truth. Here's the historical truth of that matter. Um, so, you know, a, a story, a, a, an example of that is a friend of mine who's a, a professor um, down in San Francisco and a historian. He was doing some research in Africa, and he's an African historian. And he um, found this really interesting article, uh, this information that totally destroyed a lot of the stories in this region of Africa. And this particular story, I don't have all the information, but the story uh, was very much tied to the culture in that area and the identity. And he was talking to a janitor in the archives there in, in Af West Africa, and he asked this janitor, oh, what does he think about, you know, so-and-so, a part of the story? And that janitor stopped his work and was able to tell him everything about that person and, he was, and how it connected and how his family was connected to that person. And he was very proud of it, and he was proud that his area was connected to the story. Well, my friend... Um, was listening to this and he said you know what that's not true none of it's true he's thinking to himself he has the historical he has the article he has he knows the information about this person he has the written information and he says everything this guy's saying is false but that guy it didn't matter if it was false or not because it was tied to who he was it was tied to his identity and it was tied to his village and to his people and that whole region same with medievalism oftentimes what we think is medieval fact if you look at it, if you can find the real evidence, it might not be true, but it's still connected and intertwined with identity, it's intertwined with values, then how can you unravel that just because it's not historical truth? So the idea of historical truth intertwined with stories, intertwined with film is a big part of, of why we're choosing medievalism, is a big part of our culture. Um, and it's something to be mindful of. It's mindful, be, be respectful of cultures despite evidence of historical truth or not. Um, so my friend, you know, he chose not to tell the person the truth because what, what point is that? He would be attacking their identity. He'd be attacking who this person really is proud of who he is. Um, so, you know, you have to choose and pick your battles and you have to understand what's more important sometime, uh, historical truth or heritage, identity. And that's an important thing. But going back to the first week of our class, when we talked about popular memory phase and historical analysis phase, um, and that connection and that intertwined story between the audience and the filmmakers, medievalism ties in there really well. Why do filmmakers choose to write a film in a package of medievalism? Or, or overtly or subvertly. Sometimes the story is sort of underneath the surface of medievalism, but they've rewrote it in some way. Star Wars is an example, um, other movies out there too, that the story, if it was, it, they took away the castles and the night and all that, they created something new, but it's still a medieval story. Um, and why is that so popular? Why do audiences latch onto that so much? Why do they love that genre? Why do we, why do we love the big epics? Um, why do we love those stories? Um, and think of all the shows that are coming out, even even now. 
Um, so uh, that's an important thing to maybe think about as you watch this, is that relationship between the filmmakers and the audience. How does Chaucer's audience, the original Chaucer, uh, of the 14th, 13th, 14th century stories, um, and that audience that he was portraying his story to, how does that differ or, or remain the same with this remake of his story in, in this new pastiche way? Um, and what, is the, what do the filmmakers choose to really have the message? There's a very clear message as you watch this film. Now, I haven't talked about it in this video because I don't want to give it away, but what is the underlining message that's wrapped up in this medievalism that the filmmakers trying to really show the audience? What does it say about you know, love? What does it say about identity? How is this movie so much about identity and who you are? Um, I think that's an important thing. But remember the other side, the historical analysis phase, when we got historical representation. You know, a lot of people are upset about this movie because of how historically inaccurate it is. But, but if that's not the point of the filmmaker, then, then that's an important thing to, too. But, but you can still dive in there and see some how history is represented um, and th how, how it sort of also ties to the filmmaker's agenda. Um, or evidence for social cultural values shining through. What cultural values remain the same from Chaucer's original story? And what has changed in the 21st century? Um, so that's an interesting thing. And that's when you can see changes in society then and now. Um, also, cinematography evolution. Remember, this is pastiche. And it's something that's happened from day one. But now you get really the pulp culture in there. Look at the music. Why did they choose the music that they did? Um, so these are all things, or the clothing that they chose. I mean, they, they, maybe they thought, well, we don't, why do, why do they choose to do such different medieval culture clothing uh, than they have, um, than they created? Um, and I mean, I, I love, there's a, there's a little um, sort of sports logo that they throw in there. So uh, and that's all ties together, you know, into our culture today. Hundred years from now, watching this film, you'll get more about our culture than about a recreation of a medieval past, and that, my friends, is medievalism. I think we'll have fun watching this film. I can't wait to see what you write about it. Um, do the readings of the original um, sources that I'm putting on there. Uh, hope you enjoyed this lecture, and please enjoy this film. If you've seen it before, see it in this new light of what we're talking about. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Buddy, you're a boy, make a big nice pain in the street. Gonna be a big man someday. You got mud on your face, you big disgrace. Kicking your can all over the place. Singing, we, we are.